good evening and uh, welcome to the St. Vrain Valley School District Board of Education meeting. Uh, if we could please stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Good evening, everyone. Um, Karen, before we call the roll, I did just want to make a brief comment about the video this evening. Channel 8 was having some technical difficulties. They believe that they might have had those fixed. And so Tim, who is our trusty companion in the control booth, it will let us know about 10 to 15 minutes into the meeting if we're broadcasting live. If for some reason it doesn't broadcast live, then the recording will be available on the district website by tomorrow morning at the latest. Thanks everyone. Karen, can you call the roll please? <coughs> sure. Mr. Ahrens is absent and excused. Mr. Berthold. Present. Mr. Garcia. Here. Dr. Martyr. Present. Ms. Pierce. Here. <coughs> Ms. Ragland is here. Ms. Seagrace. Here. Thank you, Karen. And Karen, were there any changes or addendums to the agenda this evening? No changes. Thank you. <coughs> For audience participation this evening, since we are holding our meeting electronically, uh, Barb notified individuals when she posted the agenda that they could make their public comments through a link on the district website. So I will read those comments now. Classes are fogging up, I'm sorry. Uh, Teresa Mudgett at 303 Shelley Court in Longmont. I wish you would just cancel school for the rest of the year. I can say that my daughter will not be going back this year. We are not sure that our schools will be safe for our children to return. Rose Piero, 1440 Moonlight Drive, Longmont. I'm concerned about something that was brought up in a recent NAACP meeting. One of the members said that there were multiple kids that still don't have internet access and sit in front of the school in cars to do homework. Can we talk with Nextlight and target these families with free internet service at least until school is back in session? Uh, this one is from Sarah, no last name, 8250 North 39th Street. We understand that you are making difficult decision decisions and appreciate your consideration. Most districts in the area, except BVSD, have moved to online learning until the end of the year. We have three questions. Why has St. Vrain Valley School District chosen not to make the decision to have online learning until the end of the year? When will a decision be made? If St. Vrain Valley School District decides to reopen before the end of the year and parents do not feel it is safe for students, staff, family, or the community to go back to school, how will the district handle that? Thank you for your time and careful decision making. Um, Don, this evening we don't have any visitors and so the superintendent's report is the next item on the agenda. Um, I would give you an opportunity to address any of these if you would like and then roll into your superintendent update. Okay. Which I believe will address them anyway. But yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, to the matter of uh, making the decision, uh, the majority of school districts in Colorado have not made that decision yet. And I think it's probably their thinking is the same as ours. I don't presume to know more than the governor or the local health departments or the state of Colorado. So we're taking our lead from the experts and uh, as opposed to assuming that we are experts in this matter. And we have done that consistently all along and will continue to do that. So what we know at this point is that the governor will be making, he has made this decision up until April 30th, and we understand that sometime before April 30th, he will make a decision for the remainder of the school year. So that's how we're handling it. It's been the way in which we've handled it consistently and I feel much more comfortable taking my lead from the governor and the departments of health than I do from other superintendents. All being said, most superintendents have still not yet made that decision. So that's where we are. If in fact, which it's highly unlikely, but if in fact we were to come back before the end of the school year per the governor's decision, then we would handle that the same way that we always handle situations. We always defer to a parent's decision but it is highly unlikely at this point in time, but again, 
we're going to stay in sync with the governor's office and the, the departments mm -hmm. of health. In terms of the access to technology, we uh, should not have to have students in parking lots doing their homework. Each of our students has a device if they have, uh, if they so desire, and they can download, if they don't have internet connectivity, they can download the information, and that's one of the reasons why we've selected iPads, and then they can take the work and do it at home. And we have given out quite a few of those iPads to elementary school students because our secondary, middle and high school, already have them. Uh, we've had great response from parents. The other thing that I'm really excited about is uh, the meals that we've been providing. We've provided literally thousands and thousands of meals to our families. And so that's been something that we're very proud uh, to be able to do. We've also received a, a lot of feedback from our parents and from our teachers that not only is our level of engagement at a very high level, but what they are engaging in is also at a very high level. And I think that those are the two things that you have to look at. One, for example, you can ask kids to do, you know, menial tasks and connect in certain ways, or you can ask them to have a structured, rigorous curriculum in each grade level and have them stay on target with the standards. And that's what we've chosen to do, the latter. So it's not only that you see high levels of engagement, but what it is that they are engaging in is also at a high level. And so we anticipate that that number will continue to climb um, from 90 to 91% uh, to continue to climb even higher. So very, very excited about the work that our students and our teachers are doing. I'm going to you know, read you a little bit later uh, uh, just a testimonial from one of our teachers that gives you an indication of the difference between saying to students, uh, pick a fun activity and do it, versus here is your first grade curriculum that's in alignment with standards. And here is your second grade curriculum, and here is your third grade curriculum. We'll also be engaging in AP tests in the month of May uh, with students uh, following the lead of the College Board. And IB has discontinued their tests for this year but students can still earn their diploma based on a body of evidence. So everything's moving along very, very nicely right now and uh, very, very proud of our students and our teachers and our staff and uh, our entire community. So do you want me to, uh, that, that's my response to those yeah, questions. Well, why don't you go ahead and, and roll into your superintendent report if that works for you. Sounds good. It's like I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very warm inside the mask. I feel like I can. All right. So I'm going to respond first to a few things that Dr. Martyr you had asked. So I appreciate those questions. And Thank you. You bet. Of course. No, they were good questions. Um, the first one was what do we anticipate? Where are we at with our cash flow in terms of all of what's taking place? We currently have between uh, cash flow and investments, we currently have about 60 million. And at this time last year, we had approximately 66 million. But part of the reason for that is we just haven't collected all of the revenue yet. Last year, we had somewhere around 167 million dollars worth of, or actually this year coming in, we have about $167 million worth of revenue that will be coming in, whereas last year we only had about 134. And so to only be six million behind right now, we will definitely catch that number and bypass it. And if there were to be a circumstance where we did not get everything through property taxes, we would get it back through state equalization anyways. So we have, in terms of cash and investment revenue at this point, we are in really good shape. The key months that we will be looking at, obviously, are March and April and then June. Because with property taxes, as you all know, you can either pay half of your property tax in March and half of it in June, or you can pay all of it in April. So we'll have a really good picture in April 
as to how many people are going to just pay the entire amount, and we'll know that by July. Now, the next significant payment for us, for our bond payment, is $12.2 million, and that's based on interest, and we have to make that payment uh, this July. And so that payment will come in, and we will make it, and we have no problem meeting that obligation. Now, where it gets the next phase that we have to pay attention to is we will have to pay $55 million by December. So the important thing for us is to see how much revenue comes in by June, which would mean we'd have this much, whatever that is, left over to meet our December obligation. Now, because Governor Polis has extended without penalty the payment dates, and he's doing that every 30 days. His orders are basically every 30 days. Weld County, for example, um, based on what Greg has shared with me, would like to see that extension go all the way through next October. Now, if that were to be the case, it would depend on how much we pull in this June, the difference between 12.2 and then 55 million. So we'll see how that plays itself out. Um, but right now, it doesn't appear to be a problem for us. And we don't anticipate that they'll go past that June, July, because if they do, it'll create issues and problems for everybody. But the, 59, the $55 million is not an insurmountable thing for us, especially because I anticipate we're going to collect the majority um, by this July anyways. So, but we'll play that out and see. But we don't have any problem meeting our $12.2 million obligation. The other thing that we look at is, you know, this uh, concept of our fund balance. And right now, we, we will end this year, if we don't outperform at all, we will end at about $121 plus million. So if we outperform by $5 million, obviously it goes up to one twenty six and so on and so forth. Last year, we outperformed by $8 million. But that was because we had a delay on $5 million from the oil and gas and the abatement, and so it came in late. So really, it was closer to $13 million. And when you look at where we are today, our revenue coming in today, you know, if you look at uh, last year, we were getting the revenue percentage was about 37.3%. This year, so we we've actually are lower in terms of our revenue coming in this year because last year it was at about 39, excuse me, 39.8 percent. Right now it's at 37.3 percent. But that's because we'll be collecting those property taxes here pretty soon and so we will bypass that because we had so much more taxable revenue to pull in, 167 versus 134. And if you remember, that's why we got so much more from our mill levies is because the assessed valuation went through the ceiling and we ended up with about $9 million on those mill levy overrides. So that was a good thing. The other figure that we pay attention to is if you look at you know, what we, where we were last year in terms of expenditures, we were around you know, 59, somewhere around 59.3%. You know, this year we're at 58.3%. So we have actually, we have actually spent less this year at this time than we did last year. So if that pattern holds, and you think about outperforming the budget by 13 million before the 5 million came in late, you know, it's eight initially and then a total of 13. If that pattern holds, we could anticipate higher than $10 million in the outperformance. I mean, if you just look at it number to number, you'd be looking at even more than $13 million, especially because our total number is higher, and so the percentage is going to be higher. Even if the percentage was the same of a total number that's higher, you'd still make more money overall. We also anticipate that our outperformance will be strengthened a little bit just by the fact that we're not going to be using fuel for our buses and electricity and heat and a whole host of other kinds of things. You know, if you have a late hire because somebody retired and you were going to fill that position, now you wouldn't fill it 
for the next two months. So we anticipate we might even see more of an outperformance. It'll be balanced a little bit by now the 1.3 from project launch that we had had in our other budget is now coming back in because we're not going to do project launch. But we are allocating several hundred thousand dollars to do our after school literacy program. So there'll be a little bit of balance there. And then we also spent about six to seven hundred thousand on additional iPads. So that 1.3 will be balanced by what we're going to do after school plus the additional iPads. And some of those iPads are going to be used to try to bring the one-to-one -one initiative down into the fifth grade next year. So they weren't purchased solely for this. We'll be able to use them for a whole host of other things. So in terms of you know, everything, I think, Dick, that you were asking about, you know, our fund balance is solid. Our looking at the outperformance is solid. Our cash flow is solid. Our investment you know, amounts are solid. Um, we've got that back up with the state equalization. The only thing that we are kind of in that space of waiting and wondering is, is the governor going to extend that no penalty beyond uh, this June or July or whatever? And you know that takes us to the $55 million question. Right. And $55 million you know, is about 75% uh, of the total amount of money that we have levied. So it's, it's not an insurmountable figure for us. I think that we will get most of what we need to get. Because 75%, I mean, the, the notion that everybody's going to take advantage of late payments is probably not going to come to fruition. So I think we'll, we'll be fine with the $55 million, but that is the only thing that we're waiting on that causes us any kind of ambiguity. Where, where that's concerned. Mm -hmm. As far as hiring goes, which is part and parcel, uh, we have hired for Burlington. We also hired the athletic director, AD, at Frederick. We are in the final day tomorrow of interviewing for Longmont. We have a great pool there, and then we'll finish up with Northridge and the executive director for HR and bring those in. We've also hired some you know, there's always a silver lining in everything with the way in which jobs are playing themselves out. We've been able to hire some additional custodial staff, and we're looking at hiring some additional bus drivers and things that will become more available as they're losing opportunities in their current positions. Right. So all of that's kind of at play right now. Um, I think our, you know, our greatest strength right now is that we're going to have you know, I'd say anywhere between 130 and 135 million dollars in our fund balance, and uh, and that will enable us to do some things. And that's the next topic that I was going to get into is negotiations. So, okay. so let me see. We got well. Let me go to senior celebrations, and then I'll get into negotiations. We have been meeting extensively with our high school principals. Well, actually, with all of our principals. Jackie conducts uh, Zoom meetings on a regular basis. We had one recently, uh, I don't know, a day ago, two days ago, whatever it was. And we talked to the high school principals about the concept of pushing back an in-person graduation till sometime in the summer. That's the place where we would like to land. We have not 100% landed on a date. Um, but that's what we're anticipating, but we're not going to make that decision until we make the final decision about the end of the school year. But we have the advantage of having our graduations done at each individual school, so we don't have to worry necessarily about trying to secure a facility that's, that would limit us in terms of that capacity. The other thing the high school principals are working on is ways in which to do virtual choir concerts virtual National Honor Society or, uh, celebrations, uh, senior night type of a celebration. And then they're talking about the potential for some kind of a, a prom, or if not a prom, a get together of uh, peers. And this coming Monday, we have another meeting with the high school principals to see where they've landed, not on graduation, but on those other things. But it's a real high priority for all of them and for us 
that we do as much as we possibly can. We've even gone so far as to talk about next year, you know, the, the two weeks for Christmas slash winter break, to look at a potential reunion for our seniors because they would be coming back home, most of them, from college or wherever it is that they have gone on to. We also have talked about if we were to do an in-person type of ceremony later this summer for graduation that we could stream it live so that people could watch it from a distance and that we also might have the potential to have some people participate virtually, you know, coming on a large screen or something like that. So all of that's in the works and all of those things are also why we are waiting to make a decision that would be, you know, comprehensive in nature. So we don't say to our students right now, oh, by the way, in-person is done, and we'll let you know next week when we find out about picking up your stuff, and we'll let you know the week after. So when we send out that letter in sync with the governor's orders, it will have all of the information that our students and our families need to plan. Now, I've also talked to the Times Call, and they have indicated that they will be doing that senior insert that they always do, so we're excited about that. And I've also talked to Jostens, who can accommodate us in terms of caps and gowns without any problem, and then also inserts if the announcements were to have to change in terms of the dates. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a lot of those details fleshed out this, uh, this Monday, but that's kind of uh, where our thinking is right now. And we've got a pretty high level of commitment. We've got some other things that we're thinking about doing to celebrate for the seniors, but a couple of them are surprises. And so I wouldn't want them to hear about it <laughs> until they see it. So it'll be a couple of cool things that the principals came up with. Uh, the next thing you asked about was negotiations. We have developed a memorandum of understanding with teacher evaluations. So we've adjusted that and what we've done is pause them, which allows them to use whatever their performance rating was at the third quarter, similar to what we're doing with students to remain intact as long as they continue with the good faith effort throughout the remainder of the school year. And then that would enable them to keep their three consecutive years in order to move towards non-probationary status. If we were to not pause and eliminate, that would break their three consecutive years, which would, which would be harmful and, un and somewhat unfair to a teacher. So we signed that memorandum. As always, Steve was great and that information is going out to all of our teachers, as is other information about leave and some other things that went out from our human resources and our finance department. As you know, we're continuing to pay all of our employees their full FTE, even if they're not able to log in the same amount of hours based on working from home and other things. And we feel very important that it's very important for us to do that um, to support our employees who have supported us and supported this community so wholeheartedly. And so we're glad to be able to do that. And so that's another piece of, it's not necessarily negotiations, we just decided to do that. Um, and I think it also helps the community that at least our employees don't have to worry about you know, at least from their perspective, I can't speak to their spouses or others in their family, but at least from their perspectives, they can count on their benefits and their salaries. So throughout this. Uh, let's see, you asked about Jared Polis's if we don't get a vaccine question. Mm -hmm. You know, I did hear that Fauci said he anticipates we'll be able to go back to school in the fall. So that was promising. I've also been watching, watching the curve as it's flattening, so that's encouraging. It's a hard one to say because we don't know where we'll be, but we would definitely be poised and ready to do online if we, if we have to. Um, I'm confident that we will be able to return in the fall, but uh, you just, you can't ever predict fully. But we will follow the governor's orders then as we have all along. And then if we have large activities, like I know we had a convocation scheduled, we may, you know, pause those and do something later on with some of those ones where we have some flexibility. But we'll just have to kind of let it see where it lands and uh, let it ride and see where it lands and we'll know more probably as the month of April and May, June. The, the nice thing is, is um, as the weather warms and you know this thing moves on, we're hoping that things settle and flatten and we can 
uh, reconvene in a, in a positive way. So those were the main things that you had asked about. They can be more than happy to <coughs> go into any greater detail if you want. No, thank you very much. That's very helpful. I, I think the cash flow um, provisions that you talked about, it, that's uh, important to keep a handle on as you are doing. And um, we don't really know how things might change going, you know, the gov governor can make different decisions uh, moving forward. And it seems to me from what you've said that uh, even with some adverse outcomes in the next six months that we would be in a position to pay make our bond payment uh, in December, uh, principal and interest in December. Yeah. So yeah. I, yeah. I think that's just something that I'm, all of us are concerned about. I know you are as well, uh, watching it going forward. Yeah. No, and you know, the other thing we're concerned about is I, I fully anticipate that our PPR will be reduced significantly for next year. Don't know if there will be a rescission this year. There, you know, there's been talk of a rescission this year. And then uh, I anticipate that we may lose some students who, because of families losing jobs, things along those lines, uh, being uh, mis you know, displaced and things. Uh, so that has a, a nexus to the finances as well. So I, you know, there are just a lot of things, a lot of moving parts. I know that uh, a lot of my colleagues and people are trying to figure out how to navigate the release of their obligation to, to Tabor because they're sitting on a 3% uh, reserve for Tabor. And um, you know, that's, it's going to be a tough place for, for school districts as they're starting with a deficit getting lower funding. I think you're going to see oil and gas revenues drop. I think you're going to see assessed valuation drop. I think you're going to see student enrollment drop. I think you're going to see PPR drop. Right. All of those things, um, well, that's precisely why we have a fund balance. So, um, and Dick, as far as negotiations, you had asked, Steve and I have agreed to pause them and we'll just wait and see what all those decisions are. And even if we don't come to any conclusions, let's say by September, whatever we decide, we would do retroactively. And we've talked about that. And that's something we both feel strongly about because we don't want to you know, be dancing in the dark, so to speak, with figures that we're not 100% sure of. So, Thank you so much. Of course, you bet. A um, couple other things. I did talk to Brian Lamer at length today about the swimming pool. They'd done a feasibility study on all of the places. And Silver Creek did show as the most practical from a standpoint of location and building and the whole nine yards. And so second was Erie and Frederick who came in with a tie. But uh, there is talk about out in the Carbon Valley area about building another pool. And obviously, Erie's going to have to do something based on their growth patterns. So it looks like, um, at least from our team's perspective, and I have a pretty extensive document here that Brian and I went over today. And I'd be more than happy to you know, give it to you or run copies. You can take a look at it. But they did a really nice job. The other thing is we found that rather than going with a six-lane pool and a dive well, for approximately, you know, 7.2 million, we could move to an eight-lane pool and a dive well and bleachers, which would give us competitive swimming, and it would only be about eight million dollars. So it would only end up being, you know, maybe another because what they have right now is in the uh, interests from the bond, they have about 6.5 million, and then they have another million that they could shift over. So it would mean that I probably contribute 500000 to a million dollars from our fund balance to go to an eight-lane pool with a dive well and bleachers, and then we could actually host swim meets versus just being a practice facility, and then we wouldn't have to add on in a future bond. Um, so I did say to Brian, that's the route that I would like to go. And so it looks like construction would start sometime in October, but we would still have to get approval from all of you 
after you have a chance to hear from Brian directly, ask all your questions, and then make a decision if you wanted us to proceed with Silver Creek or a different site. So as soon as this process, it's not going to slow down. I mean, they've got everything they need right now to start construction in October, so that they don't need an answer from you right away. Um, and we can set up a Zoom meeting or whatever else you want to set up with with Brian and his team and, and myself and Jackie, and we can answer whatever questions that you have. But I was uh, pleased to know that we could go to a competitive swimming pool as opposed to a practice pool, and we'd have the dive well as, you know, as the dive well as well, and not have to really impact our finances much at all. So I feel good about that. Don, that's fine. Yeah. May I ask a question? Sure, of course. Um, so what I just heard you say is the, the funds to build the pool are essentially coming out of um, bond money, so it's construction money. That's not money that we could otherwise... It's, it's interest. It's interest. Yeah. But it's still not money that we could otherwise use for operations in the event we do have enormous tax deferral collection. It's, it's in a separate pot. It has to be used for, cap for construction, for capital. Yeah, and I mean, you have all kinds of opportunities in terms of emergency declarations and things like that that you could make decisions around, but uh, it's, it's designed to be used for, you know, like for example, when we passed that mill or that bond in 2008, and we ended up outperforming, so we ended up doing all of that work at, at Erie Middle, even though it wasn't part of the original bond plan. So we did get legal counsel to weigh in, and I have legal counsel that we are able to use that money for this particular purpose. So, and I hear what your question is. Yeah, just but. because what was happening just before this is we're looking at, you know, right. we could challenging uh, revenue collection times. And um, I just want to be clear that when we flip to talking about building a pool, we're not taking away a revenue stream that could otherwise be used towards teacher salaries. No, no, no. This could not be used for teacher salaries. And since we wouldn't start construction on the pool till October, if we did run into any kind of a challenge with our, uh, you know, our fifty-five million dollar payment in December, we, you can always adjust. You know. So. Um, and so my my second question is, have we done any uh, thinking or calculations towards what it would do to the budget to operate the pool, not just build it, but to maintain it? Yeah, we have a pretty good idea, and you know, some of that would be, because we would actually generate revenue by hosting swim meets, by concessions, and then also in the summer months. We would not be using the pool uh, for physical education, we would in the fall, but basically for girls and boys in the winter and the spring. But in the summer months, we would actually have opportunities to open it up to the community for swim lessons, scuba diving, you know, certifications. Um, water safety, all those kinds of things. So we would actually generate some revenue as well as the cost of maintaining it. Okay, thank you. Sure. The other thing, Paul, is you know, we pay money to use other pools. Uh -huh. You know, for like the, we've got the YMCA that we use and then we have MOUs with uh, the pool over by Timberline and when we purchase extra lanes at Erie, things like that, we have to pay. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of balances. So it itself. sounds like it'd be self-sustaining or better. Yeah. And if yeah, and if there were to be costs, it would be minimal. Okay. So, be costs beyond balance. I'm sorry if I am <laughs> humbling. No, like this thing's <laughs> digging into my ear. <laughs> I'm like, hey, Lord. All right, there we go. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I have. I do want to, to just say, you know, to give Jackie an opportunity to, to weigh in. Uh, she has been uh, literally going around the clock and leading meetings with our principals and our LSC. There's a ma massive effort at the, uh, you know, at the re resource center across the street and out in Frederick. And, just uh, stellar leadership. Not that it's surprising, it's just, it's appreciated. And so Jackie, I don't know if you wanna share some of the things that you've been uh, doing, which is quite a bit. So. Yeah, well, and it's definitely not me. It has taken a pretty enormous team. We've had about 150 volunteers 
staff volunteers who have come in to run our community resource centers. Up until this week, we had two community resource centers as well as 11 different sites where we're distributing lunches. And we distributed over 1,500 iPads in a week. And we still have families coming um, this week. We gave away 100 on Tuesday. We have people stopping by every day, even when the community resource center is not open. So we know tomorrow we'll have more families who are accessing iPads as well as printed curriculum. Uh, we are getting ready to have all of our teachers beyond our core content teachers start adding um, content in the electives and in the specials areas and that will begin on April 13th. Our learning services team also just put out support learning support plans to all of our teachers in the core content so we're not actually creating explicit lessons anymore like we did for the first two weeks but we have put out documents that show them exactly what standards should look like for the remainder of the semester um, through April and then into May if necessary and then we've also linked all of the best resources to teach those standards so there will be flexibility for teachers to lesson plan but those support documents ought to should add consistency and coherence and help our teachers finish strong and help students be prepared for the next grade level um, when we come back in August. And really that's what we've been very focused on. We are also doing a lot of support of students through our counselors, but um, we are really staying focused on the academic work and then we're reaching out to families who are not engaging and very explicitly helping them problem solve what it is that are the barriers and our counselors are doing a lot of that work. We're monitoring our students who are in e-credit recovery very closely. We're monitoring our seniors very closely and um, this week in addition to um, looking at that percentage of engagement and um, pushing that engagement up a little more we're also looking at the quality of engagement. So we're asking our principals to report back to us not only the number of students and the percentage engaging, but what is the quality of engagement? Are students partially engaged or are they fully engaged and returning all of their assignments back to their teachers? So that's been our work here. Um, I Again, I would reiterate that um, none of this would be possible. We would not have the confidence that we have to do the work that we're doing right now had over the last um, decade a full system um, and a, a strong foundational system. Had that not been built, we would not be able to be in the position we are for our students right now. So definitely the reserves that have been built up, the technology, the infrastructure, the curriculum and assessment that we have long had in place, the digital curriculum that we have long had in place, all of that has allowed us to pivot in the last month or so. And um, you know, I think, it's, I think it's working. And we're now in a phase of just doing individual problem solving and calibrating. So the system is, is in place, it's working for the masses right now, and now we are personalizing and just doing that day-to-day -day calibrating and problem solving as questions come up. Thanks, Jackie. Um, Don, did you have anything additional to add? You know, just uh, if I went around the departments, you know, HR hasn't missed a beat in terms of hiring. We're actually taking advantage of this opportunity to hire. And so that's on track. Greg and his department with finance, accounts payable, payroll, all of that. He's on target with Brian Lamer for reimbursement based on our emergency declaration and working with uh, the emergency management system to, to submit for reimbursement. So everything's going well there. Our operations and maintenance teams, because construction is considered essential from the governor's order, we continue to move forward with our New Mead Elementary School and our Longmont project and our Frederick project and all of the things that we're doing. So um, just could not be, I really, I could not be more proud of our team they just have been incredible and our community as well so it's uh 
we're in that space where we really believe now that we will be better as a system on the other end of this. We've identified some ways to mitigate substitute teaching shortages. We've identified ways to address snow days. We've identified ways to address a whole host of things that will cause us to be an even stronger system. How we manage late start days as opposed to the ways in which we manage those now. How we take advantage of summer and times when students are not in school. So it's, uh, you know, we don't welcome these types of difficult challenges and these types of situations. But uh, I could not be uh, more proud of the team that's in place to deal with them. And if they afford you the opportunity to review the way in which you do business and then come out on the other end doing business even better, then that's, that's something we're very interested in and that's something that we're, we've been doing as well. So a lot of other things I could update you on, but uh, you know I'm sure I'll think about it all when I'm driving home. <laughs> but right now it's just a big uh, thank you to everybody involved. Last thing, uh, we, did the, we did select the Teacher of the Year, um, Jeanette Rivera-Gonzalez, and I had a Zoom meeting with, with her today along with Lorinda Sampson. She's out of Northridge, the teacher, and Josh Atherton. And, you know, Jeanette was a former student at Lyons, so she's one of our homegrown students and then became a paraprofessional and then 2008 since then she's been working at at Northridge and you know one of the things we talked about today is you know among her test scores always being you know great in terms of uh, her students uh, she's one of the most caring people you'll ever meet and you know, she drafted a, a separate card for every one of her students during this situation contacted their families stood outside and showed them a card and that kind of thing and you know the, the kids were excited to see her from their windows and stuff like that so just a, a real superstar so I enjoyed my conversation also did a video today for all of the uh, the nominees and then I made a recommendation to Josh Atherton that we celebrate them at our gala in the fall as opposed to just letting it kind of dissipate because of the situation with tribute to teachers. So he thought that was a good idea. And uh, we also were able to give Jeanette a $4,000 check from Staff Toyota. Uh, so she'll represent uh, St. Brain in a, in a really just an outstanding way. So, yeah. Thank you for doing that. And congratulations to her. Yeah, no, she's a superstar. Yeah. Joey, can yeah. I just share one comment? Absolutely, please. Um, uh, related to John's um, sharing with us some of the financial update, the Finance and Audit Committee is going to, will be meeting um, remotely for the rest of the year. Uh, I think our next meeting is next Monday, so we will still have our Finance and Audit Committee, our community members, looking at our cash flow, making sure we can make bond payments, payroll, contractor payments, so just information for you guys that we'll still be meeting. And you know, to your question, Paula, the the 55 million is 75 percent of the 73 million that we levied for the bond so we don't it's not the whole 73 that we have to come up with in December it's just 75 percent and so that's why I have a level of confidence that we'll pull that revenue in before the end of the summer so can I read you guys this thing that uh, Kale shared with me and then I don't know when Kale comes on that agenda but uh, now this is where it's hard to read, but I'm gonna <laughs> figure this one out here. Yeah, it's the glasses don't fit the same. Uh, okay. This was sent to uh, Kale and, and everybody on their team. I work at Grandview Elementary teaching first grade and my husband works at Trail Ridge Middle School as a dean of students. I would just like to share a huge wow and thank you so much all in capitals for all of the planning your team has done in order for teachers to feel prepared as possible for the transition to online learning. I would love it if you could share this kudos and thanks with anyone else who has helped lead all of us during this time. Everyone involved deserves a standing ovation. From sharing lessons in ELA and math for the first 10 days to sharing the learning support plans for us to use to plan for future weeks to come, I feel that we are in a very positive and unique position having this kind of guidance and support from our district. 
my first grade team has been able to plan with ease and less stress. We have felt supported and appreciated. And it goes on and on and ends from the bottom of my heart. Uh, thank you for the vision of a clear structured system that has been put into place during this exceptional time. It does not go unnoticed that our district has truly set us up for success. I am proud to work for St. Rain Valley School District. And this is uh, consistent with, you know, I've received others that have said, you know, I have a colleague in another state or I have a colleague in another district and they're basically being told, you know, get it done and good luck. And I'm not trying to compare and do all that kind of stuff, but it really was such a massive lift by learning services. And, you know, Jackie, you might want to respond to this because you just cannot imagine how much work went into doing this. Um, it's, it's really just impressive, so. Yeah. Um, well, again, it just was such a team effort. I think, um, I think what was impressive is probably two weeks or about a week and a half, maybe a, even just a week before we actually closed the facilities, before we closed schools, um, Don and I had spoken and decided that let's let's give it a try let's start planning in the event that we should have to go online and it was not 12 hours later that that um, team our learning leaders which are consist of our curriculum coordinators as well as all of those um, coaches who are out in buildings our um, instructional technology coaches our stem coordinators they really pulled together and began to plan those lessons. Once they got a template and once they had a vision for what that would look like as students went online and they opened up those lessons and once they understood the user interface and they had that template, they were able to roll all of that work out for all of the grade levels and, and all of the content areas. We thought we would only be able to get math and English language arts completed. And by the end of the second week, they also had social studies and science completed for the high school so that all four content areas could be done by students. And so um, we, you know, it mirrors what we expect in St. Brain anyway, which is that we operate as a system, that we don't leave it to chance, that we have quality control that all kids get a great experience, that that experience is rich, um, it's robust, it's comprehensive. And um, when we approached this work, we had some really clear values. One value was that the, the lessons and the instruction continued to mirror what we do in classrooms every day as much as possible. And we use technology every day as much as possible. Another was that it was engaging. Um, that it is what people are calling now asynchronous, was that we were not doing school online, but we were doing learning online because families needed flexibility and they were sharing devices and they were um, trying to work around their work schedules and their lack of daycare. And our teachers and our principals have really um, grabbed onto those values and they've implemented aligned with the values of our system. And so um, it's beautiful to see them recognize and compliment, but really, again, that's the work we do every day in St. Brain. We, we operate as a system because we believe in equity. We believe that no child should have an experience left to chance. And because our, our system was really already in place, it allowed us to just take it you know, online and to do what we do so well anyway. So I will respond to that teacher, um, Don, if you forward me that email and make sure that um, you know we thank her as well for noticing what we've put out in terms of support and using that really, really well. Sounds good. Okay, thanks, Don. Um, before we move on, I do wanna just uh, thank you and appreciate you uh, for your leadership Jackie, your leadership. I, I have a feeling <clears throat> that it's it's likely there's a, a scenario for people who might be on the outside looking in that this looked really simple and seamless for St. Brain. And while 
some aspects of it were because of that system that was in place, the community support, the finances, the curriculum alignment, technology. There is no doubt that this has required so much effort behind the scenes in planning, and, and you described a lot of that, Jackie, and so did you, Don. So, so please pass on my appreciation and the board's appreciation to everyone who has had a part in that. And also want, do want to thank our family members, our community members, the business community, our students, the teachers, all of the staff members that are still in the buildings. You know, Mead Elementary School is still moving along. Um, we have a lot to be grateful for, for and a lot of appreciation. So thank you very much for all of that. Uh -huh. All right, uh, thank you for the superintendent's report, Don and Jackie, for your input. We don't have any reports this evening, but we do have several consent item agendas. I've got to figure out how to read with my glasses um, and the mask. Do board members have any consent items this evening that they would like to pull for further discussion? No? All right. Uh, then we have uh, consent item 7.1, approval staff terminations leaves. 7.2, approval staff appointments. 7.3, approval of minutes for the March 11, 2020 regular meeting and the March 18, 2020 special meeting. 7.4, approval second reading adoption board policy JLCD, um, administering medications to students. 7.5, approval of change order three to construction manager, general contractor, contract for Mead Middle School addition and renovation project. 7.6, approval of change order six to CMGC contract for Silver Creek High School addition and renovation project. 7.7, approval of amendment to CMGC contract for elementary number 28. 7.8, approval of amendment to CMGC contract for Spark Discovery Preschool Renovation Project. 7.9, approval of amendment to CMGC contract for Vance Brand Auditorium Renovation Project. 7.10, approval of amendment to CMGC contract for Coleridge Middle School Bond Project. 7.11, approval of amendment to CMGC contract for Trail Ridge Middle School Bond Project. 7.12, approval of fee adjustment two to Lyons Middle Senior High Auditorium Addition Project. 7.13, first reading, adoption, board policy KDE, emergency management, safety readiness, and incident management planning. 7.14, approval of recommendation to hire principal for Burlington Elementary School. I would make one note that the new principal at Burlington Elementary School will be Jennifer Webster. Typically, we would have Todd here to introduce Jennifer to us, and that's not possible this evening. So Jennifer, if you're watching, we will look forward to meeting you and welcoming you at a future Board of Education meeting. With that, I would entertain a motion for approval of our consent items, please. So moved. By Jim? Yes. And a second by? Second. By Karen, and Karen, could you please call for the vote? Uh, Mr. Ahrens is absent. Mr. Berthold? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Ms. Pierce? Aye. Mr. Agman, yes. Ms. Segrist? Aye. And Dr. Marner? Yes. Great. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, everyone, for that. I am adjusting. I, I can't tell if anybody's smiling, or <laughs> it's, it's very different yeah. to not be able to see people's facial expressions this evening. Joey, uh, did you yes. want to check in on our broadcast or did you get the Oh, I, I did check in with Tim, sorry, um, during Don's update. It is not uh, broadcasting, so the fix um, has not been repaired yet. I'm confident they will get it repaired, but the meeting will be uh, recorded and then Barb will get it up. Barb and Aaron will get it on the website uh, no later than tomorrow morning. Yep. Thanks, Paula. Action item 8.1 is an adoption is the adoption of a resolution proclaiming teacher substitute teacher appreciation week for May 4 through 8 2020 Don would you like uh, a board member to read uh, those uh, resolutions this evening for teacher appreciation week or would you like to read them 
uh, you know what, somebody else would like to, I'm purple again. <laughs> All right, you have done a lot of talking this evening. Um, do we have a board member, Dick? You were a former teacher. It seems fitting. Um, I would be honored to. Would that Thank be an you. honor? Okay. Sure. Do you mind reading both of them? Would you like to share with somebody else, sir? Uh, I would be glad to read both, but okay. if someone would like to uh, honor the substitute teachers as well, I'd be glad for that as whatever. I'll start, and if somebody would like to jump in, uh, wave your hand. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you, Dick. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, so the title is uh, Teachers Appreciation Week Proclamation. Whereas today's teachers mold future citizens through their guidance and education, and whereas today's teachers encounter students of widely differing backgrounds and abilities, and whereas society expects public education to provide quality services to all children, no matter what their backgrounds or abilities, and whereas the country's future depends in large measure upon the education youth receive today and whereas teachers are charged with the daunting task of assuming that no child is left behind by public schools and whereas teachers spend countless hours outside their classrooms preparing lessons, evaluating progress, counseling and coaching students and performing community service and Whereas the St. Vrain Valley School District recognizes that its teachers are providing quality educational services to our children, now therefore be it proclaimed the week of May 4th through 8th, 2020 is Teacher Appreciation Week in our communities. The St. Vrain Valley School District urges all citizens to join in recognizing the dedication and hard work of our teachers by expressing their appreciation for a job well done. Proclaimed Wednesday, uh, April 8th, by the Board of Education and Superintendent of Schools. <coughs> Thank you, Dick. Appreciate that. Would someone else like to uh, read the Substitute Teacher Appreciation Week proclamation, please? Yeah. Okay. Paula? Great. Thanks. Substitute Teacher Appreciation Week proclamation, whereas the St. Vrain Valley School District joins the nation in recognizing substitute teachers as an essential part of the district's education system. And whereas substitute teachers are dedicated to providing quality instruction for the students of this district and demonstrate their commitment to give time, energy, effort, and talents in the best interest of all students. And whereas the substitute teachers of the district provide an invaluable service of teaching students in the absence of their regular teacher in a most professional manner and play a vital role to ensure the quality of students' education. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed the week of May 4th through 8th, 2020, is Substitute Teacher Appreciation Week in our communities. The St. Rain Valley School District urges all citizens to join us in saluting these dedicated men and women. Proclaimed Wednesday, April 8th, 2020, by the Board of Education and Superintendent of Schools. Thank you, Paula. You want me to call Kale? Um, yeah, why don't you go ahead and call Kale while we're voting? That would be great. Thanks, Don. All right, I would entertain a motion for approval then for action item 8.1, which is the adoption of resolution proclaiming teacher substitute teacher appreciation week may 4 through 8 2020 uh, in the hopes that uh, maybe we'll be able to thank some of those people in person uh, in the near future so moved thank you dick and a second second chico chico oh, thanks i can <laughs> the mass i can't tell who it's not always uh karen can you call for the call for the vote please thank you mr aarons is absent mr berthold yes mr garcia yes Dr. Martyr? Yes. Ms. Pierce? Aye. Ms. Raglin, yes. Ms. Segrist? Aye. Thank you, Karen. Agenda item 8.2 is the recommendation for approval of elementary social studies materials adoption. Kale, good evening. Do we need to vote separately on the substitute teachers? I have it all as one, okay. actually, as one, um, okay. Okay. one agenda item. Thanks, though, Paula. Unless somebody tells me differently. Okay, um, Kale, how are you this evening? 
I'm sorry, I did some static there. I couldn't hear you. Oh, can you hear us okay? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank you. Great. Welcome to our meeting. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us. And uh, I'll go ahead and, and let you kick things off. Thank you. Uh, members of the Board of Education, I would like to bring forward the recommendation on behalf of elementary pilot teachers and our social studies coordinator, Jenny Pettit, to adopt curricular materials for elementary social studies in grades K through 5. Our process began in uh, the fall of 2018. Uh, the adoption committee included 34 elementary teachers from across the district. The committee evaluated seven programs and choose excuse me, to pilot two. Um, impact, input was gathered from pilot teachers, students, parents, non-pilot teachers, and the community. After selecting pilot programs, piloting the program for a school year and gathering input about the selection, uh, our committee recommends McGraw-Hill's impact program for grade K through three, and then grade five, and then Gibbs Smith's Colorado story for grade four to the Board of Education for adoption. A few things about the, these two programs. All of the materials were aligned to the new 2020 Colorado Academic Standards, as well as uh, support best practices in social studies instruction. Um, happy to report each program includes a robust online platform that engages students and extends learning. Uh, these platforms include all the print materials and digital formats also, which was really good, presentations with video, on connections, interactive, uh, multimedia, vocabulary, weekly updates, and that's one of the parts I really like about these two programs is that they're updated almost on a weekly basis. Uh, both programs also have links to Google Expeditions, state resources, so students can take virtual uh, trips of um, um and other interactive sites. All of the digital components we've tested with our two learning management systems, uh, School and Seesaw, and the rostering has been uh, flawless. Feedback from students and teachers have been overwhelmingly positive. Teachers and students find the resources to be engaging with rich, deep content in all four of the disciplines of social studies, which are geography, economics, and civics. Uh, the total adoption, resources, and extra duty pay for professional development is uh, $1,180,954 in change in uh, fiscal year 2020. And that's based upon estimated student enrollment uh, for next year. So I've got just a couple of uh, brief statements. So the teachers, we have three teachers that we're going to, going to uh, be at the board meeting uh, to talk about this. The first one is from Tanya Sadler. She's a fourth grade teacher at Northridge. Um, Tanya says, piloting teachers and students have found the text to be user-friendly for all learners. Many high-quality photographs, illustrations, spotlights on famous Coloradoans. And, and I just want to remind the board that in fourth grade, we teach Colorado history, which is a departure from a lot of students' curriculum. Um, Tanya further states this is there is easy using the text and content supporting English language arts standards and English language learners. Um, Another uh, statement from Ariane Tasker, who's a first uh, grade teacher at Soaring High. She says the McGraw-Hill materials provide rich resources, high-level text, and an inquiry-based learning process to allow students to gain a deep understanding around social studies topics. The online platforms have been very helpful for students and teachers in a variety of formats. Teachers can combine the digital curriculum components on a digital platform to create lesson plans to present to students. Students have access to high quality resources that can be applied in different settings. And uh, finally, from Scott Norman, a fifth grade teacher at Timberline, he said he's using the McGraw-Hill uh, curriculum. He said he's offered his fifth grade students opportunities to consistently deepen their knowledge around how it fits into the historical timeline while understanding ways that these pieces of history affect their lives today. Uh, the program does an excellent job of offering flexibility for teachers, creating opportunities for in-depth inquiry, solidly covering all the standards and gets uh, students to relate to people's experiences from the past and be able to understand how elements of history impact their lives today. 
Um, that is just a quick overview uh, of the adoption. So I present it uh, to you uh, for consideration and um, any questions. Thank you, Kale. Do board members have any questions or comments from Kale? I know this is different than typical because we usually have teachers and more of an explanation, um, but but certainly uh, trust the process and, and everything that, that's gone on. You know, that doesn't mean those things haven't happened. We're just not, we just don't have the people here at the board meeting. Uh, questions or comments? No, Paula? Hi, Kale. Um, I just want to thank you for the, the overview that you're providing over the phone. And um, again, as Joey said, I do trust the process. We've, I've seen a number of these come through over the years, and you have an extensive number of um, excellent teachers that have vetted this. So um, with that and the summary you've provided in our packet as far as um, some of the things I look for, like abilities to differentiate and um, different viewpoints. and tying in um, literacy skills into social studies. I, I think it looks really strong and um, I just thank you and your team for doing all the uh, all the vetting of this, for doing all the work and the piloting um, to bring our students the best curriculum we can. So thank you. Well, thank you very much for that comment and uh, really the credit goes to Jenny Pettit, uh, our social studies coordinator and the uh, teachers who uh, worked so hard on this pilot and uh, making this a reality for our district. All right, Kale, that's it for questions. So thank you very much for calling in and for all of your work on that committee. Please pass along our appreciation. And then uh, board members, I would ask for a motion for approval for action item 8.2, approval of elementary social studies material adoption. So moved. By Chico and a second. second. By Karen. Great, and Karen, can you call for the vote please? Yes, um, Mr. Ayers is absent. Mr. Berthold. Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Dr. Martyr? Yes. Ms. Pierce? Aye. Ms. Raglan? Yes. And Ms. Segret? Aye. Thank you, Karen. Action item 8.3 is the first reading adoption, new board policy. Oh, absolutely, yes. Thanks, Kale. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I sure appreciate the support. Okay, take care. Thanks, Don. 8.3 is first reading adoption, new board policy, BEAA electronic participation in school board meetings. This is timely given our current situation. Um, Paula, you worked with Barb on uh, the memo uh, for this. Would you mind making a brief introduction uh, for the board, please? Yeah, certainly. Um, I, it's somewhat self-explanatory um, that we need to adopt this policy um, in order to have remote meetings. Uh, so we can actually vote and hold a have a quorum, hold a meeting, vote uh, in an ele in electronic manner um, in the event we choose to do that in the near future or at any time. Um, so it's essentially uh, the format of it is driven by CASB, has been looked at by our attorneys. Um, and and it's, es it's essentially only if a meeting in its entirety is called to be remote, not if we... Am I, am I Hold on a second. Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure because we were looking at two different policies. Uh, this is, oh, okay, so let me start over. This uh, policy is for individual board members who want to participate electronically in a board meeting. So this is when we, uh, there is no change to our normal procedure that we would be meeting in the boardroom um, if any one of us for any reason can't be here but still wants to participate, we can um, call in, video in, and we would have, we would be counted towards the quorum and have the right to vote. That's the difference right now is if you, you we may call into the meetings, but we don't have the right to vote. We're just an observer if, um, if this policy remains unadopted. So this specifically lays out um, that, that that is allowed um, and sets some parameters around I believe it's just two times that we're allowed to do that before the board needs to consider any additional requests to call in or meet in electronically um, so yes my apologies for going down the wrong lane there but this is also a CASB driven policy and has been looked at by our attorneys um, so it really just gives us the flexibility to uh, individually still participate in meetings in the event we can't personally be here 
Okay. Thanks, Paula. Do board members have any comments or questions on the policy? Dick? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. I have a, uh, just a comment about uh, the third from the end paragraph that starts, if the request is approved. Do we all see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's not clear who's approving that request. I, I think we should specify um, who's authorized to approve the request to participate by uh, participate online. Um, and uh, by the same token, I think that there should be a provision that the request uh, to participate online should not uh, be unreasonably withheld. So, Dick, what do you think about just getting rid of if the request is approved? Why not just say a board member who board member a board member who attends and participates by electronic means? I mean, do we really need to make a request? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would be fine with that as well. I think mm -hmm. that the um, the way it's set up, we notify, and then there's a allusion in that paragraph to being approved. And we don't really specify what that process is. Well, and I don't need to, I mean, yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, at that point. Um, I, I think the idea is is to limit it so that board members aren't calling in repeatedly. Uh, but that is addressed, of course, later on in the policy a little bit later. So if the board is in agreement, then I would strike the words, if the request is approved and simply begin that paragraph with a board member who attends and participates by electronic means. I like that change. Any questions or any um, issues or concerns? Everybody else in agreement with that? No. Okay, great. Uh, any other questions or thoughts on the policy? All right, um, then was that a no? I'm sorry, the face max, I can't <laughs> see everybody. So I'm just, I need to pay extra attention. We're good, okay. So then what I would do is I would entertain a motion uh, for approval of action item 8.4, or 8.3, pardon me, which is the first reading adoption new board policy BEAA electronic participation in school board meetings uh, with the understanding that we will strike in that paragraph if the request is approved and begin the paragraph with a board member who attends. So moved. By Paula in a second? Second. By Dick, thank you. Karen, can you call for the vote, please? Yes. Mr. Aarons is absent. Mr. Berthold? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Dr. Murder? Yes. Ms. Pierce? Aye. Ms. Raglan, yes. Ms. Segrist? Aye. Thank you, Karen. 8.4 is the approval of use of CASB sample exhibit BEDA-E notice of virtual school board meetings. Paula, did you want to introduce this one? Again, this is, it's really rather straightforward. This will be um, the sample notice that Barb will use in the event uh, that we had a virtual school board meeting. Yeah, this is the what I started to speak to uh, before. So the first policy we just approved is for individuals to call in, but in the event um, that we change the entire structure of the meeting to go remote, whether all of us are calling in or we decide to do it, um, just have a, a select number of people in the room. In the event we have a um, structural change of the meeting, this would be the notice that we would publish publicly to let the public know that mm -hmm. and how they can um, submit their comments to us. So this um, exhibit in and of itself does not uh, need to be part of our policies simply because it, it uh, has to be changed every every time but this would be the um, template that uh, we would use to notify the public thanks Paul any comments or questions pretty straightforward Dick? Uh, thank you madam president I, I I guess my comment is that with regard to the first paragraph um, it although it is a template uh, it I think it should be more generic because this template uh, refers specifically to the governor's um, executive order uh, of April 1st. It would change each time. It would change. The reason would change it, that we were calling a meeting. It would. It would. It would change. It would have to. Um, 
It's really just a sample exhibit. Yeah. You to it's really just a sample, so you would have an idea. You're not actually approving these these words. These words. Yeah. You're saying the template. This is a sample. So you're saying this sample. This format, based on this example, is adequate. So you're not actually approving the exact words. Does that make sense? I'm not articulating that very well, Dick. Well, I, I think that uh, in the case where we do have examples, we have forms for a variety of um, implementation of our policies uh, throughout, that this particular example should be more generic um, because this, this will, in fact, be part. It'll be B-E-D-A dash E as part of our policies. No. It will not be filed in the policy manual. So where will it be found? Barb will keep it Barb's for her reference and use. We're just approving that, yes, we think this template is sufficient to use moving forward. Oh. If you actually want it filed, <coughs> you know, in, in the actual manual, we can bring it back again, certainly. I mean, we, you know, we can discuss it, but it's really, truly a, a, a formality for a template. It's not going to be filed in, in the board policy and with the board policies. Barb just wants to be able to use this, this format. Oh. Well, I, I guess my view is that it sh if it's going to be used just as a generic format, that first paragraph should say, state the reason. You know, whatever the whatever the precipitating event is, should appear in that first paragraph, and um, that makes the rest of it, of course, fits um, without modification. Um, well, th that's just my view. Mm -hmm. My you say second, that our um, lawyers vetted this sample exhibit for use just this time yeah, so and then an example for use with the different reason next time yeah or okay this is actually driven by casby and our attorneys did look at it and in general just to back up a little bit when we did our policy review back in 2014 mm. 15 yeah we pulled a lot of exhibits out of policy simply because they are very fluid and um often need to be updated by each department or best practice or fill in, fill in the blank situations. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them got pulled out um, just so each department would have the ability to develop exhibits that worked for them at the time in real time without constantly having to come back to the board. So this is really sort of like a board business exhibit. So um, this isn't something you know that'll apply to the rest of the department's in the school district, this is just how we decide to notify the public when we have changed the underlying structure of a meeting. To a virtual meeting, correct. Yeah. So we don't need to put it in policy for all of the departments and the public to see the sample, which would have to be very generic. We're simply agreeing as a board that this is the general, this is the format that board will, that Barb, or whoever our secretary is at any future time, will follow to Publish to the public to notify the public that we have changed the format of the meeting. So this is not an official policy document. It's just we're agreeing on how we're going to publish things to the to the public. Yeah, I, you know, and and Dick, I, I don't think we really need to spend any more time on this, quite honestly. But I I, I trust that Barb will update that appropriately each time. But I really, am, if you want to have her make it generic, I'm perfectly fine with that and approving it on that. What I'm good either way. I don't know that it's worth a lengthy discussion, though. Uh, well, as you wish. I I think I have my second comment is on the public participation. It it reads to me, and I may be misinterpreting it, uh, that members of the public may request items to be placed on the agenda. Yeah. And. I was just uh, somewhat surprised by that. That's not any different than than typical. So when a, when it, someone comes to give uh, public comment, um, 
or do we get suggestions from the public for our agenda that we adopt? We get requests from people absolutely beforehand, before the agendas are created. So members of the public submit agenda items for the board? They can request, yes. Um, I think that last sentence in there is the final determination whether an item will appear on the board agenda will be at the discretion of the superintendent and board president. Addresses the fact that, you know, things may be requested, but whether they actually go on the agenda or not is still to be determined. Yeah, I think it's important that, uh, I, I guess I just read the previous sentence as being more um, well I, I thought that um, I wasn't aware that that process existed mm -hmm. yeah people can go through barb and request an agenda item be placed hmm. I'm comfortable with the with the, that last sentence though I think that helps mm -hmm. okay any other comments or questions No? Okay. Then we'll, um, I would entertain a motion then for approval of action item 8.4, which is the approval of the use of CASB sample exhibit BEDA-E notice of virtual school board meetings. So moved. By Jim and a second. Second. By Karen. Karen, can you please call for the vote? Yes, Ms. Jarens is absent. Mr. Berthold? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Dr. Martyr? Yes. Ms. Pierce? Aye. Ms. Ragland, yes. Ms. Segrist? Aye. Thanks, Karen. And our final agenda item this evening is 8.5, the recommendation for approval of closure of all district schools and buildings from March 13, 2020 to April 30, 2020. Don, did you have any comments before um, I open it up to board members? Just that uh, we will continue to make these recommendations to the board based on the direction of the governor's office and the county and state health departments and in my last conversation with Governor Polis and the uh, representatives from his office he indicated that he would be making some decisions and announcements for the remainder of the school year somewhere in that uh, ballpark of the 20th to the 24th of this month so I'll just keep in line with with uh, with that process if that's okay with the board Thanks. Uh, any comments, board member comments or questions? Chico? Um, just to reiterate the fact that the, the buildings being closed is not a statement of learning is not happening, right? And we, all the stuff that we've talked about, just to make sure that's clear for folks to understand that the learning has not stopped continuing. Cool things are happening there, but um, our buildings are closed. Thanks, Chico. That's a good clarification. Anybody else? Nobody? All right. Then I would entertain a motion for approval of agenda item 8.5, uh, closure of all district schools and buildings from March 13, 2020 to April 30, 2020. So moved. By Karen and a second. Second. Paula? And Karen, can you call for the vote, please? Mr. Aarons is absent. Mr. Berthold? Yes. Mr. Garcia? Yes. Dr. Martyr? Yes. Ms. Pierce? Aye. Ms. Raglan? Yes. And Ms. Segrist? Aye. Thank you, Karen. All right. Um, Don, I think you had a, a closing comment this evening. Yeah, I just wanted to, as far as the discussion items, I just wanted to reinforce one of the priorities as we've embarked on this online learning has been to make sure that every student in our district has access to the devices they need, they have access to the curriculum they need, so much so that we not only did the online, but we also created hard copy packets for those first two weeks for students and parents who felt more comfortable and everything has been translated and we have really talked about it within our system that we've gonna, we're gonna leave the resource centers open uh, longer periods of time for kids who want to come in and access assistance, pick up materials and supplies, all of those kinds of things. And I really wanted to, to emphasize that point. Cisco was great in terms of funding hotspots around our district. So we have 10 hotspots where 
people could download and years ago when we made the decision to go to iPads it was for that purpose that you could actually download curriculum and then work from an environment that did not have internet access but I really wanted to emphasize that everything that we do and everything that we talk about is uh, in the context of making sure that every single child has access to what we're providing. The other thing is I wanted to make sure people weren't developing a sense of anxiety about their grades dropping. You know, we're looking at that third quarter grade and then we're asking our children uh, for a good faith effort. So, and if, they, if they're having a hardship or a struggle, you know, we're flexible. We're not looking to be punitive in any way, shape, or form, and we're not looking to cause anybody to backslide, whether it's progression to the next grade or it's graduation as a senior. And I just really wanted to, to reiterate to the board that that is at the top of our list of priorities as we're pushing this information out, that it's non-punitive, that it's flexible, and that it's, uh, it's supportive for our children. Because we understand that some parents are going through struggles with loss of job, you know, inability to, to make payments and things like that. So uh, I know that that came up at the beginning, and I just wanted to reiterate that it is something that we're paying very, very close attention to to make sure that, uh, that nobody is impacted negatively, at least from our system, uh, regarding the learning. And Jackie, I know that we've had those conversations over and over, but I just wanted to assure the board that the equity and the access is really, really important to us. So, and the non-punitive nature of what we're doing. Thanks, Don. And then it's my understanding also that it, if a student has a, a grade that they would like to work on and to bring up, that there are opportunities for that. On the Absolutely. Website. Students want to improve their grade. They can work with their teacher and create a contract to do that and then advance their grade to a higher level. And all of that uh, was articulated in the communications. And so uh, absolutely they can, they can do better if they choose. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, any final board member comments or questions this evening uh, before we wrap up the meeting? Just all right. Really quickly, it's such an unprecedented time, and it's just so impressive. And um, I'm just blown away with the professionalism, setting the bar so high, which you do every day anyway, but you're leading um, just without any uh, knowns, and you're just doing such an amazing job. I'm really looking forward to all the lessons we learn as a, um, as a world from what's happening here, and I think that this, what you're doing here is, is just an incredible standard. Um, going forward for handling any kind of um, emergency. So, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Uh, our study session next week on Wednesday, April 15th has been canceled. Our ne next Board of Education meeting will be Wednesday, April 22nd. Uh, we can talk, Don, as that gets a little bit closer about how we want to handle March financials. We can maybe just ask Greg to call in if the rest of the board is comfortable with that and then uh, follow this format again uh, so that we're safe. And Tim, thank you for being here uh, to make sure the, the meeting is, in this case, not broadcast, but videoed and then placed on the website. We appreciate it. So, all right, everyone, be safe. And thank you to everybody who is ensuring that learning is still happening uh, and students are, are still having all of those great opportunities. Uh, I would entertain a motion uh, for uh, to adjournment the meeting, please. By Karen in a second. Second. By Chico, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Good night. I miss your smiling faces, or at least facial expressions. <laughs> That's what we should do.